Hey everybody, Joanna here. Today I'm going to be giving you a wrap up of all the books I read in June and the first half of July. And the reason I'm doing this format, which is a little unusual compared to the typical monthly wrap ups you see, is because a lot of the books I started in June, I finished in the first half of July. And I'll probably be copying this format for the end of July into the month of August since I'll be out of town, out of the country at the end of July and the first half of August. So it just makes sense for now. So we'll see if this trend continues throughout the rest of the year. But the first book I want to talk about, actually I want to talk about two books to start out with. And that's the first two books in the bind up of the Long Price Quartet by Daniel Abraham. And so this particular series is evocative of feudal Japan. And we have these wonderful, fallible characters and I, I would say we have characters from different social classes in society, as well as different genders and different ages. And I've just enjoyed every single one, mainly following four characters, I would say. And we have this interesting magic. So in this empire, we have these various cities where there are poets and the poets in these cities, they hold this certain magic, this these magical thought form creatures the first one you meet in the first story, Seedless, is very reminiscent of No Face from Spirited Away, if you ever saw that film. It's part of what keeps their prosperity in check in the Empire. And there's a lot of tension that builds with what's happening with that thought form, with that creature Seedless, and how it's affecting the lives of these people and what they have to do to overcome the obstacles presented without giving away too much. This story has actually made me want to travel more than any other story I've ever read. That goes for books one and two. And there is a 15 year gap between books one and two. So you do see how characters age. In the beginning of the book, we have characters who are in their teen years. And so you see where they end up a little bit later in life. And I understand that that may continue for books three and four in this particular quartet. I would say that if you've read The Sword of Kaigen by Elmo Wong and you want more of those kind of vibes, maybe consider checking this out because I feel like you get a similar kind of atmosphere. It's been a while since I read The Sword of Kaigen, but it does have that Japanese inspired feeling to it. There is a bit of a school setting in the very beginning in the first story. We don't stay there very long. I do love Daniel Abraham's prose. I feel like it's emotional and nostalgic without feeling overly sentimental, but it never feels weighed down. It never feels dense in description. It brought me into my heart, which is my favorite kind of story. And um, it's very political too. So just keep that in mind. But if you're into that kind of thing, then you might really enjoy the Long Price Quartet. And of course, I'll offer more thoughts as I read on, possibly do a review of the entire quartet when I finish. Next book to talk about is a historical fiction book, Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. This is a standalone book about the Battle of Thermopylae when the 300 Spartans held their ground against the 2 million Persians, which was a suicide mission. They all died, but they did it anyway, and it's why they did it. And they did have a tactical advantage in this Rocky Mountain Pass near the Hot Gates. So we have this one lone survivor and he is telling the story to the Persian king as to how he became a Spartan soldier and what it took to be a Spartan soldier. The Persian king is very curious about this. He's very curious about Spartans because they never surrendered. They held their ground. They were courageous. So it's a framed narrative. We start out with this character who's a lone survivor and go back into his story. Now, there are several highlights I want to point out as far as I saw them. So I really appreciated the discussions on courage, what is fear and its opposite. Lots of philosophical discussions in here, what it means to be a soldier, what it means to be a great king and leader, some great speeches, by the way, and some great discussions on the role of women in society and how important they were. And so I appreciated all of those things. But where I struggled with this book was a similar complaint I've heard in some reviews, which was connecting to the characters. And here's the thing. Being that it, it's a framed narrative, I never forgot that it was a framed narrative when I was reading this story. I felt like the way our character tells this story, it felt like at times he was just going through lists of descriptions. It was beautifully written. I feel like Stephen Pressfield is a gifted writer. His prose matches the tone. It matches the style of that time, in my opinion. It felt very authentic to that experience. And he had a lot of rich historical detail in the story. But at the same time, because it felt it was just kind of being told to you so much, 
I felt like I, like I said, I never escaped the fact this was a framed narrative. I never escaped the fact that our character was just telling a story. Whereas when I read The Warlord Chronicles by Bernard Cornwell, I connected so much to Durval, which is also a framed narrative, by the way. And Durval is telling the story much after the fact about King Arthur. And I felt everything Durval went through so much that I forgot it was a framed narrative half the time. I felt the action of the battle scenes in that particular trilogy. And there are some great descriptions, again, of battle scenes in here, but it just felt like it was trying to engage the reader based on the drama of the bleakness. And again, it's well-researched. I know Stephen Pressfield knows his history. As a reader, emotionally, it didn't really engage me, that stuff. But if you want to hear more from Stephen Pressfield, he does have a YouTube channel and he has a wonderful video where he talks about this battle. And for me, watching that video before I read the book actually helped me to appreciate the book more. So I recommend checking that out. Now to talk about book two in the Edan trilogy by Philip Chase. This is The Prophet of Edan. And I do have a spoiler-free review for this book, as well as a spoiler-free review for book one and a wonderful discussion on book one, if you're curious. And I will be hosting a discussion at the end of August for book two with the same group that I hosted in for book one. So if you want to hear a bit more about that, check it out. I'll just say that I think that this particular book might appeal more to modern fantasy readers, given the amount of action scenes that are available in it. But there are dragons. He does not hold back on that bloodshed in battle. <laughs> um, I did get emotional at the end of the book. As I mentioned in my review, the elf was my favorite part. It was my favorite character, as I men mentioned in my spoiler-free review. I just loved those scenes, and I loved the philosophy behind the story. So um, I was asked if I preferred book one over book two, and it's really a toss-up for me personally. There were some things handled in book one that I greatly appreciated, but different things in book two. The elf stuff remains my favorite part of this series so far, but if I really had to choose, I think I preferred book two over book one. I think. I think that's the case. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure I, I preferred book two over book one. Anyway, there is a lot of geopolitical stuff that's happening, so I do recommend keeping the map handy. I had to. And thank you, Philip Chase, for gifting me this beautiful copy. I look forward to discussing it with Philip and friends at the end of August. Another recent read is The Wisdom of Crowds by Joe Abercrombie. This is the final installment in the Age of Madness trilogy, and it's my final book in the First Lost series, excluding Sharp Ends, which I do intend to get to at some point. I do have a video where I do an overview of the First Law experience, as well as a gush on this trilogy, and I promise there are no spoilers in that video. But I do love this series. I especially loved book three. I loved the whole trilogy. That trilogy is definitely the best of the best when it comes to Abercrombie, as I explained in that video. Uh, best character work, especially female characters. Um, excellent themes. Excellent humor. All the things you could love about Abercrombie are in it. Editing Joanna here. I just want to add that I didn't talk about Grimdark in my first law video. I was just hesitant to do so because I know there's been so much debate about what that term means here on booktube. And I understand that term was inspired by a game, a tabletop strategy game, Warhammer 40,000. I've always personally thought of it as just a critique of fantasy idealism and a critique related to that of human agency, whether we have any. But I wanted to go ahead and mention that Kronk, the book guy, did a wonderful first law video, which I saw after posting mine, and he actually set out some parameters to define the term grimdark, and it was fantastic. So I told him I was just going to point to his video from now on, but we also had a wonderful discussion about this on Why Read episode 18. He was my guest, along with Ben from Books with Bangus Khan, and it was a wonderful discussion. I was surprised, like, how many moments actually touched me. <laughs> And I don't know if I'm weird, as I said in that video, for feeling that way, but this was just so good. It was amazing, amazing work. And um, I really hope you check out the video if you're interested. Again, no spoilers. And now to talk about Ships of Merrier by Jani Wirtz. I had a wonderful discussion with A.P. Canavan from A Critical Dragon and Philip Chase about this particular book. That's the first book in this particular bind-up. And it's very hard to talk about this story without spoilers, but... I'll just say that in the first book, we follow two half-brothers who are trying to work together to dispel of a curse. We had at one point before this curse came along, unicorns and centaurs and sun children. 
there is a wonderful play of light and color and sound, great descriptions of music. Music is magical in this world as well. So we have a very developed magic and world in this story. Now, um, as far as my personal enjoyment, I'll just, I'll say honestly, I have a bit of an unpopular opinion, which is I actually preferred book one more than book two, but there was still much I appreciated in book two. I would say that part of that had to do with a certain character we follow in the first half of book two that I just personally didn't attach to. He was a well-written character. It just wasn't my favorite type of character. And I also really loved the female characters in this story so much, but they were mostly in the second half of the book as well. Most fans of the series tend to prefer book two, so just don't let that steer you away if you're interested. I would say if you are interested in this series, to get acquainted with Jenny Wirtz's writing style. Now she has a lot of different books and a lot of different fantasy books with a range of writing that is accessible to complex. This is her more complex prose. I'm not sure if this would be the best place to start unless you love very stylized prose. Um, she's very gifted at it, but it is something that can be an acquired taste for some readers. It's important to keep that in mind. I recommend if you're not sure read To Write Hell's Chasm. To Write Hell's Chasm is not part of this world, but I think it will get you acquainted with Jani Wirtz's more complex style of prose. And in any case, I still really enjoyed my time with this book, had many positive things to say, especially in that discussion, and I really look forward to continuing on in this series. A quick read to mention is The Sunset Limited by Cormac McCarthy. So this is a novel in dramatic form. So if you see here, it's basically in play format. There is an HBO adaptation, which is word for word the script, and it is so good. It is with Tommy Lee Jones and Samuel L. Jackson, and I highly recommend it. I watched it after reading this. I got so emotional over this story. So this follows two characters. They are described as black and white. And yes, that does pertain to their skin, but they have very, very different views on the world. It's just a conversation between these two characters, honestly. And it was interesting for me because after reading Shogun earlier this year, which I really enjoyed, but after reading that, one struggle I had with Shogun is I felt like it was very dialogue heavy. And I enjoy good dialogue. I mean, I just talked about Abercrombie, love his dialogue, for example always gush about A Song of Ice and Fire and George R. R. Martin's dialogue. I love good dialogue, don't get me wrong. And I think Clavel was great with dialogue in Shogun, but I felt like it was so heavy in dialogue. And I wanted a bit more touch of atmosphere and setting, especially to feel like I was in feudal Japan. So that was one part of the experience of Shogun where I felt was a little bit lacking for my personal reading taste. I don't think that'll bother anybody else. It's just a me thing. I'm a settings person when it comes to reading. So... If you had tried to pitch this to me as it's just a conversation between two characters in one room, I might have not been sold, but of course it's McCarthy and my goodness, I loved it. I loved it. And I think that actually the adaptation on HBO does bring forth a lot of atmosphere um, with the way it's set up and with the, even the music, the soundtrack. But this was a deep conversation about basically nihilism versus spirituality, specifically Christian spirituality. And it was heavy. It was heavy and emotional and I loved it. <laughs> but I have to say it is the deepest depiction of nihilism I think I have ever read in literature. And I've always thought that McCarthy had some nihilistic views in his books, but I think this one takes the cake, honestly. But I was surprised because I know this sounds weird and this is probably again a me thing, but I really felt a lot of compassion come up in me for both characters when I got to the end of the book. And for that, I'm just, ah, oh, I'm still emotional over it. I loved it. Um, fantastic work. And I look forward to picking up more McCarthy. And I should mention, I did pick this up thanks to Jimmy's recommendation from the Fantasy Network. I think we both had slightly different perspectives or emotional experiences with this book. But I think that that's the beauty of this kind of story is that it can bring forth so much from different readers and maybe in different times of your life. So I do recommend this if you love McCarthy and you like that exploration or those topics of like nihilism versus spirituality, check it out. It's very short. And lastly, I'll quickly mention I read a nonfiction book called Stolen Focus by Johan Hari. And this particular book was... Uh, not what I expected. I think I expected it was going to be a self-help book. It's not a self-help book. 
especially because the subtitle says why you can't pay attention and how to think deeply again, something like that. But it doesn't really teach you how to think deeply again. <laughs> it just tells you why you can't pay attention. And according to Hari, you have no control over your life. You are doomed to algorithms and to internet powers that be and to phone addiction. And he himself is still struggling with these things with his attention span and phone addiction, as he explains at the end of the book. But I don't know. Um, I think the way that he presented his message just didn't personally work for me. He did pull from a lot of experts and research, but it felt like it was more just to support his case. And there's nothing wrong with having a strong opinion and using research to support your claims. But I think a strong argument is to offer the counter evidence or exceptions to the rule. And I didn't think he did that enough for my personal taste. Plus, he has a whole chapter on ADHD in the book. And I think it's very outdated. There's a lot more to ADHD from what I've learned than what is discussed in the book. Uh, so I felt like his arguments were a little simplistic and one-sided. His research seemed a little cherry-picked. However, I did feel like there were some positive things to take away from reading it. Like, I think I did listen to it on audio, by the way. I think that as a result of, of this book, it did actually make me reevaluate mind wandering and daydreaming, which is a healthy thing to do. I had heard about that outside of the book, but it was just nice to hear that there was value in doing that. So I did appreciate those takeaways. And when you do read a book that's focusing on this topic about where you put your attention, it does get you to think about where do I put my time and attention? And I think any self-assessment work where you evaluate where you put your time and attention is going to be valuable. So anyway, I think there were some valuable takeaways, but I just wasn't crazy about the presentation. That is it for now. That is my wrap up. Please let me know in the comment section below if you've read any of the books I've mentioned, if you're planning to read any of the books I've mentioned or anything at all. I'd love to hear from you in the comment section or say hi if you just want to say hi and let me know you're here. Thanks and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.